Father God, thank you that you're not a silent God who stays hidden and that we just have to make guesses about, but thank you that you're a God who speaks. Thank you that because you love us, you speak to us. And thank you that you've had what you say written down for us in the Bible um, so that we can hear you and get to know Jesus. And we pray um, that that would happen for all of us today, whether we uh, know Jesus a bit or a lot already. Please would you help us to uh, get to know him more. And if we uh, know almost nothing about Jesus, would you help us as we look at your Bible to um, begin to see something of who he is and why he's such good news. Amen. Now, the big moment in that um, little scene that we just had read for us is the moment when Andrew goes to his brother Simon and he says, we found the Messiah. You might find it helpful as um, we look through this to have it open in front of you. We've got these blue Bibles and in the blue Bibles, we're on page 1064. So if you're um, of a reading age, then why not find page 1064? And 64, that story with the big moment when Andrew goes to his brother Simon and says, we found the Messiah. And the Messiah is God's promised saviour king. Okay, so when you hear Messiah, think God's promised saviour king. He is going to rescue a load of people for God. He's going to be in charge of a remade world where everything is good forever. Okay. That's the job of God's saviour king, in charge of a remade world where everything's going to be good forever. So the Messiah wasn't just big news for the Jewish people back then. People like John the Baptist, who some of us heard about in the last few weeks. Uh, People like Andrew and people like Simon. The Messiah is still the biggest news possible for people like you and me. Because if it's true, then he is God's saviour king. Andrew sounds like, in that scene we saw in this bit of the Bible, he sounds like he's convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And when Andrew says that, I think that's a moment that should make all of us go, wow, this guy thinks he's found God's Messiah. So here's a question for you to think about just in your head, okay? How convinced are you that Jesus is God's Messiah? And if you're already convinced, what is it that convinces you? Or, if you're not convinced, what do you think would need to happen for you to be convinced that Jesus is God's Messiah? I'm not going to ask you, but just have a think for yourself. How convinced are you that Jesus is God's Messiah? This is a bit of the Bible where we get to see what started to convince Andrew. And the Apostle John has written it in his book for us to help us understand how we could be convinced about Jesus as well. So, I'm going to help us to think, I hope, about how Andrew was convinced. And it's not very complicated because basically there are two bits to it, okay? The first is this, he heard about Jesus and then he got to know Jesus. That's how he got convinced. First he heard about Jesus, then he got to know about Jesus, got to know Jesus. And he heard about Jesus from this guy, John the Baptist. John was a man sent from God to tell people that his saviour king was coming and John had a load of people you have to imagine yourself back into first century time John had a load of people who were following him around listening to him and to his teaching and Andrew was one of those guys he was one of the guys following John around uh, Jerusalem and the Jordan and all that kind of area and one day Andrew and this other guy who were with John and they were there with John and Jesus walked past and John said look that guy over there That is the Lamb of God. Now, I have brought a little lamb with me. Okay, Um, here is my lamb. I don't know if you actually get lambs this small. Nick Mullins, where's Nick? You've birthed a lot of lambs. Have you ever birthed a lamb that small? No, okay, so mine's like a super cute lamb, okay? Lambs, um, they're, they're very cute things. The question is, why would John call Jesus the Lamb of God? Strange thing to do, isn't it? Um, why would Jesus call John, the, John called Jesus the Lamb of God? It's to do with something that had happened to God's people hundreds and hundreds of years before when there was a time when God came in judgment on people's sins and God's people were at risk of dying for the things they'd done that weren't good and that were evil and that God hated. And God, to save them, he said, kill a lamb in your place. 
So instead of you die, have a lamb die instead of you. So the lamb, when God's people thought of a lamb of God, they thought that's the one God gives as our substitute to save us so that he doesn't judge us but forgive us. The lamb took the penalty for their sin instead of them. And that, I'm going to put the lamb in my pocket. It's a bit rude, isn't it? But I'm going to go for it. It's cute enough and small enough. The lamb took the penalty for their sins instead of them. And that is Jesus's job. That's what John's saying when he says Jesus is the lamb of God. Jesus is the son of God come to earth so that he could be killed on a cross. An extraordinary thing. And God says that if we'll have him as our king, the risen Jesus, come back from the dead, if we'll have him as our king, as the one in charge of us, then he'll be our substitute, like that lamb was the substitute for God's people way back when. Oh, what the heck, I'll leave him over there. The lamb of God, the one who takes away our sins uh, by taking our place in God's judgment. So if John is right that that's who Jesus is, then it is brilliant news because it means forgiveness from God and eternal life with him. And that is the claim that Andrew heard about Jesus. Okay? So Andrew's there with this other guy, with John the Baptist, and they hear from John, this is the Lamb of God. And I want us to think about how Andrew tried to work out if that claim was true. Is this really the Lamb of God? Is this really the Messiah? All right, so I'm going to uh, make some claims to you, okay? And I want you to tell me how you'd work out if they were true. Let's think of some claims to make. Um, here's one claim I would like to make. I'd like to claim that this is the, the tastiest chocolate. Um, that, uh, oh, let's, let's make a smaller claim. I think this is a really tasty piece of chocolate. Okay? That's my claim. I want to know, how would, you, how would you check if that was true? Any ideas? Uh, Naomi, how would you check if that's true? You eat it. Would you mind having a little, would you try test out our claim for us? Um, Naomi thinks the way, she's all wishing you had your hand up a bit sooner now. Um, what was the claim again? That was a tasty piece of chocolate. Um, any, are you able to tell us what, what you make of that claim? Are they? Oh, thumbs up. Okay, good claim, that one. Okay, here's, here's another claim I want to make. Um, two uh, balls that look relatively similar, right, other than different colours. Uh, uh, my claim here is that one of these balls is squidgier than the other. Okay? How are you going to test if that claim is true? Another, no, how are you going to, sorry? Squish them. Yeah, by squishing them. Try out. So tell, me, tell us if you think one of those balls is squidgier than the other. What do you think? The pink one's squidgy and the purple one. Naomi's right. You'll only, know, you'll only believe us, maybe, if you try out for yourself. You could choose to believe us. But yeah, you're exactly right. One of them is squidgier. You want to try it as well? Uh, you can try it afterwards. You can try it afterwards. Um, you have to trust your sister for now. Okay, here's another claim. Um, standing on one leg with your eyes closed is harder than doing it with your eyes open. How would you, how would you test out that claim? What would you, how would you test out that claim, Joseph? By doing it, yeah. Anyone, fancy, let's, uh, anyone who wants to, stand on one leg. Yeah, yeah um, multi, stand on one leg. Okay. And have a think, how hard's that? How hard's that? Then go down again uh, and close your eyes and then stand on one leg. Um, <laughs> right. How, you've had a try. Was, that, uh, was standing on one leg harder or... Was it harder with your eyes closed? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Harder with your eyes open. William's, William's unusually good at... He's better at bouncing with my eyes, his eyes. Yeah, I believe that claim. I had a dodgy leg for a bit, and for a while I couldn't actually do it with my eyes closed, but that's beside the point. Um, here's, a, here's another claim for you. Um, Bruce Beatty has visited every house in Carlisle. Not been inside it, but visited every house in Carlisle. Um, how would you test out that claim? Uh, if, if you, I mean, some of you might already know the answer to the claim, but if you don't, how do you test out the claim? How would you test it, Eloise? You'd ask him, wouldn't you? And he's not here this afternoon, so we can't ask him. Um, you could ask someone else who already knows. But um, here's, a, here's another claim. Robert, um, Barbara Gardner can speak five languages. Um, how would we find out if that's true? Ethan? Ask her to speak. Go on, then. No? Anyone? Oh, we need someone, with, someone else. Anyone, um, anyone want to try and find out from Barbara if she can speak five languages? 
I don't know the answer to this one. You can't. No, there you go. I am. <laughs> that would have been really cool if you could. That would have been a great accident to just fit. Here's one more. Tony Blair has announced that he will stand for election as an MP again, and that he would then like to become the leader of the Labour Party. How are you going to how are you going to find out if that claim is true? Um, Ethan, how are you going to find out if that was true? Ask Tony Blair. How are you going to ask Tony Blair? Do you have his number? No. no? Okay. How are you going to? It's a good idea, though. It's a, it would be, that would be the best way if we could, isn't it? Um, how, how are you going to find out if it's true? Google it. I think that's what I'd do if, someone, if I genuinely thought that might, as far as I know, there's no truth in that. I just made it up. But um, you, we could Google it, couldn't we? And we'd expect that some newspapers would be reporting it. So there's a whole, like, we're, we're pretty used to hearing all kinds of claims and we work out if they're true in various different kinds of ways. So what do you think John's disciples did when he said that Jesus was the Lamb of God? How were they going to find out if that was a true claim? Well, what they did was they tried to get to know Jesus. They went round his house and they hung out with him. That was how they started it. Let me read from chapter 1, verses 37. There's a little, um, down on that page, 1064, bottom left corner, Um, There's a little 37. I'm just going to read a couple of verses from there. When the two disciples heard him say this, heard John say that about Jesus, they followed Jesus. And turning around, Jesus saw them following him and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent that day with him. You see, if you want to know whether Jesus is God's saviour king, it'd be extraordinary if that's true. If you want to know if it's true, the best thing to do is to get to know Jesus. If you want to know if the chocolate's tasty, you eat it. If you want to know if Jesus is God's saviour king, you get to know him. And Andrew, he started to be convinced really quickly, didn't he? So John the Baptist had told him, this is the Lamb of God. And less than a day after hanging out with Jesus, Andrew was convinced enough to go and find his brother Simon and say, hey, we found the Messiah. I don't think he understood everything that that meant um, right at that point in his getting to know Jesus. There was lots more that he still needed to be convinced of later on. But it's getting to know Jesus that will help us know whether he really is the Lamb of God. That's basically what Jesus' disciples, his closest friends and followers, that's what they did with their whole time with Jesus. They spent all their time with him. They got to know him really well and they saw everything that he did and said. And ultimately, they saw the way that he died and then came back from death. More than everyone else, those disciples, they saw what Jesus was like. And that was what convinced them. But it is going to have to be a bit different for us, isn't it? If we're going to be convinced about that claim that Jesus is God's saviour king. Because we can't just follow Jesus around and stay at his house like they could 2,000 years ago. And that is why people like Simon Peter, Andrew's brother Simon, that's why they're really important to us. Because Andrew, he took uh, his brother Simon to Jesus. And verse 42, Jesus looked at Simon and said, You are Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which when translated means Peter. And so Jesus gave Simon a new name. His name actually meant rock. And he gave Simon this new name because he knew right from the off the job that Simon Peter was going to have to do. Peter became one of the apostles. And apostle is just a word to describe how they're Jesus' specially chosen witnesses. They're the ones who met Jesus and saw what he did and knew him really well. Now, we cannot go around Jesus' house and get to know him Uh, get to know Jesus in exactly the same way they could. But that is the whole reason that Jesus had his apostles write the Bible for us. Simon Peter wrote some of these bits of the Bible. There's a bit, there's a couple of letters that are from Peter and the book of Mark, we think Peter had a big job in helping Mark know what had happened in writing his book. And so even though we can't go around, stay around Jesus' house, we can still know and get to know Jesus. If we're going to get to know Jesus for ourselves, if we're going to be convinced one way or the other about Jesus, it can happen in basically the same way 
that it did for Andrew and the others. Because first, we hear the claim about Jesus. I guess everyone here today, at least, has heard the claim about Jesus. He's the Lamb of God, God's Saviour King. He can bring us forgiveness and friendship from God. And then when we've heard that claim, we check out if the claim is true by getting to know Jesus through the Bible. Let me um, try and illustrate this using Amazon, okay? Um, here's, here's, I do quite a lot of my shopping online. I'm like a terror to the high street survival of high street shops, okay? Um, and the problem with buying online rather than going to the shop is that most of the time you've never seen what it is that you're buying except in photos. So how can you decide if it's going to be a, a good product and worth your money? Maybe if, um, it might be that some of you are just trusting kind of people that um, just believe whatever the manufacturer said about it and assume that their photos are lovely. Um, and so you just, you just see it and buy. I do not shop like that. Here's what I do. I read the reviews. Can we have the next slide? So this, this product has 20,483 customer reviews. I don't read them all, but I read quite a few carefully and thoroughly so that I can decide which reviewers do I trust? I try and work out what they're like from the way they've written and do they really like And I work out which reviewers I trust because Amazon reviewers, when they're online writing, this is what I think, this is a good pair of trousers or whatever it is they write. They don't write in quite that accent. But what, um, what, they're, what they're basically doing is they're witnessing to the product that I've not seen but that they have. And when you find a reviewer that you trust, you can hear about the product from someone who's tried it out and seen it and knows what it's like. So that means that we don't have to guess on Amazon. It's not just a pure guess about what we're buying. If the witnesses are good, then you can be pretty sure about what you're buying before you've ever seen it for yourself. Now the Bible, I'm gonna say, is a little bit like an Amazon review, except that it's much better and more reliable because it's written by witnesses specially chosen by God for how well they know Jesus. And God, we're told, made sure that what they wrote was reliable. All, and the whole reason he did that, why would he go to such trouble over a book like this? Well, all so that we can still get to know Jesus for ourselves today. Jesus said to Andrew, come and see. Okay, if you're going to remember one thing that Jesus does in this story, that would be a great thing to remember. He said to Andrew, come and see, come and see what I'm like. And he invited him around his house. And Jesus, in fact, basically says the same to us. He says, come and see. We come and see Jesus by reading the testimony, uh, the witness testimony in the Bible through his apostles like Simon Peter, who he chose specially at that point. Jesus says to all of us, come and see. And here's what I think that means for us. First of all, if you're a teenager or even younger, here is what I think John chapter 1, why I think John chapter 1 is good news for you. It means that when you're deciding... Uh, when you're deciding what you think about Jesus, whether you're convinced about Jesus, you don't just have to take your parents' word for it. Okay? Now, I imagine your parents are lovely people who are good at telling you the truth lots of the time. Uh, I imagine they try and tell you the truth all the time. Um, I'm pretty sure they're going to be good at getting a lot of that stuff right. But when it comes to telling us about Jesus, the Bible is way better and more reliable and up to the job of telling us about Jesus. Because the apostles who wrote it, they are God's trusted reviewers. They were there at the same time as Jesus. They knew him face to face. They, walked, they lived with him. They got to know him. So we don't just believe in Jesus because of what our parents tell us or because of what people at church tell us. It's great to have people telling us about Jesus. But we don't just believe because of what people today tell us. We can look at the Bible and get to know Jesus for ourselves. Jesus says to all of us, come and see. And that is a really cool thing that Jesus says, you can get to know me for yourself. And here's what I think John chapter 1 means for anyone who's not a Christian. With Christianity, we have got a historical claim to investigate. Did Jesus die and rise from the dead? I mean, it all hangs on that really, doesn't it? Is he God's son and his saviour king? With Christianity, you've got a person to look into and to make a judgment about. And I want to say that the only way to do that properly and with integrity is to give the Bible a look. Some people buy things on 
Amazon without even looking at the reviews. Maybe uh, you do that. Um, my wife sometimes does um, and thinks I'm a bit obsessed about reviews. But personally, I think to buy things without reading the reviews is a crazy way to shop. And it's definitely a crazy way to decide about Jesus. If Christianity is true, then this book is God's chosen way for us to be sure about Jesus. To be a Christian is to entrust our whole lives into Jesus' hands. And we're not supposed to do that with a blind faith. The way to be convinced, one way or the other, is to get to know Jesus. So don't be a slightly crazy Amazon shopper uh, who doesn't read the reviews. Jesus is much too important for that. Don't decide either way without getting to know him in the Bible. Jesus says to everybody, come and see. For life, I think, is a really good way to do that. We do lots more, though, than just this as a church. So if, if you want to know how, how you could look more into the Bible and get to know Jesus there for yourself, then asking someone over coffee about some of the different things we do would be a really good next step. But the last thing I want to say before I finish is for Christians. Um, and I guess this a little thing first. There's lots we can learn isn't there, from John 1, about how important it is for our friends to meet Jesus in the Bible. Um, When we talk to them about Christianity, our big aim is not to win an argument or simply to persuade them about some facts or just to share with them our own experience of being a Christian and how great that is. Our big aim is to introduce them to a person, to Jesus. Our aim with our friends and our neighbours is to share with them what Jesus is like. And the best way for them to see that ultimately is by showing them in the Bible so that they can hear the claim and see Jesus for themselves. But but I want to say that that is a cool thing to see from John 1, but it's not the big message for Christians from John 1, I don't think. I think the big takeaway for us from John 1 um, isn't about evangelising our friends. It's cool, isn't it, that when Jesus said to Andrew, come and see, he knew that Andrew would bring his brother, Simon, and that Simon Peter would write bits of this Bible so that you and me, years later, could hear Jesus say to us, come and see. Now, he's the God of the universe with a pretty awesome plan to make himself known to all of us. I think John 1 is here to encourage us in our certainty about Jesus. He's the Lamb of God, the Saviour King. And we know that not with a blind faith. We're convinced about it, if we're Christians, because of what we know of Jesus. We really have been able to get to know him through those disciples, those apostles who got to know him. Because he has let us come and see who he is. That's a great thing to be able to be sure about. So I'm going to say a prayer to finish, thanking God for that, and then we're going to sing.